In this video, we will demonstrate the full potential of QuakeCaster. We will be carrying out experiments testing the four leading earthquake occurrence hypotheses, which are used to try to predict earthquakes. But are these hypotheses accurate? Today, we will see how these hypotheses stack up to QuakeCaster earthquakes and real earthquakes. Let me start by explaining the four hypotheses. Hypothesis 1 states that earthquakes are periodic. So all the earthquakes slip the same amount and are separated by the same amount of time. Hypothesis 2 states that earthquakes are time predictable. This means that the larger the last quake, the longer the wait until the next one. Hypothesis 3 states that earthquakes are slip predictable, meaning the longer the amount of time for stress to accumulate, the larger the next earthquake will be. And hypothesis 4, known as the Poisson hypothesis, states that earthquakes are random in size and time. Now we'll be starting experiment one, and we will be testing slip and time predictability. Today we have help from two high school sophomores, Matt and Colin. Matt will be recording the time of each earthquake, and Colin will be marking the rupture length along this piece of tape that we place along the rock surface. It's important to note that Matt will start timing at the first earthquake. Now Colin will be measuring the cumulative slip distance in centimeters, and he'll be reading these times out loud to Matt, who will record them on a computer. 7.5, 20, 32, 39.5, and 54, 66, and 80.5. Matt will now be reading out the cumulative times to Colin, who will record these times on the computer. 1 1.37, 2.84, 4.52, 6.18, 7.84, 9.58, 10.18. So we've graphed the data that we collected in the previous experiment, and the x-axis represents the cumulative time in seconds, and the y-axis represents the cumulative slip distance in centimeters, so how much the earthquake ruptured. Now what we're going to do is draw in the classic staircase plot, and what the slope represents here is we're waiting, and then an earthquake occurs, wait, earthquake, Wait, earthquake, you get the idea. So I've just eyeballed and drawn in the best fit lines for the slip predictable hypothesis and the time predictable hypothesis. The slip hypothesis states that the longer the wait, the larger the next earthquake will be. And the time hypothesis states that the larger the last earthquake, the longer the wait until the next one. Now if we look at our data, we see variability in terms of wait times. There's longer wait times and then there's shorter wait times. And there's variability in the slip distance. Again, larger, smaller slip distances. So there's not a lot of consistency. Now, if we look at this data in, in comparison to the hypotheses, we don't see a lot of compatibility. Neither of these hypotheses perfectly fit the data. So it's quite difficult to predict when the next earthquake will be. Here we have stair-step diagrams of quake caster earthquakes and earthquakes that occur along the San Andreas Fault. And you can see that the quake caster data is similar to the data collected on the park field section of the fault. This chart shows magnitude 6 earthquakes that occur roughly every 20 to 30 years along the park field section of the San Andreas. And the dates shown are from the time of the gold rush to present day. And we can see that this data does not fit perfectly the slip or time predictable hypotheses. It doesn't quite match up. For example, the 1934 earthquake occurred about a decade earlier than the average interval. The 2004 earthquake struck one to two decades later than the average interval and was somewhat larger than, than its predecessors. So there's variability. This chart shows magnitude 2 repeating shocks, which occurred quite frequently. And the data shown is from around 1985 to present day. At first glance, these earthquakes appear periodic. They look like they fit both the slip and time predictable hypotheses. 
But if you look closely, the data doesn't always perfectly match. Even after running Quaycaster just once, there's a light dusting of powder that appears along the rock surface. And this powder is known as fault gouge. And this actually occurs in real faults as well. And it's formed when the fault faces slide past each other and they grind their rocks into a pulverized powder. They've actually found fault gouge in the San Andreas Fault, and it's the mineral talc. And they think this talc decreases the friction within a fault and is therefore responsible for fault creep. We can visibly demonstrate fault creep by pouring baby powder onto our rock surface. I've just poured the baby powder onto the porcelain tile. Now we're going to run Quakecaster and we're going to observe the earthquake behavior. Another way to show decreased friction is to flip over the granite slider to the smooth side and to run Quakecaster using it that way. So we're seeing more frequent but smaller earthquakes and in some cases we're seeing the fault creep where the sliders are moving slowly and steadily along the rock surface. Quakecaster can also demonstrate Coulomb failure criteria, which holds that when a fault is close to failure, either increasing the shear stress or decreasing the fault clamping stress, which is also termed normal stress, will promote fault failure. To demonstrate increasing the shear stress along a fault that's close to failure, we're going to reel in the line until the slider is on the verge of an earthquake, and then by increasing the shear stress, we're going to pull the rubber band, we trigger an earthquake. To demonstrate decreasing the clamping stress along a fault that's close to failure, again, we'll reel in the line until the slider's on the verge of an earthquake. And then, we're going to pick up the top slider, and we trigger an earthquake. Now I'm going to run Quakecaster a few more times, and I would like you just to observe the slider's behavior. Does anything happen before the slider moves forward? So there's a little hop. So in that last trial, we just observed a foreshock before an earthquake occurred. Now that was a little short hop that you saw before the slider slipped forward. But it's important to note that these foreshocks occur rarely. I mean, we just saw one or maybe two. So we can't really use these foreshocks as predictors of earthquakes. Now we're moving on to experiment five, and we will be testing to see whether constant failure stress or constant minimum stress is a better predictor of earthquakes. We have help from three USGS employees, Ross, Volcon, and Jake. Volcon will be recording the time in seconds of each earthquake. Ross will be recording the force immediately before an earthquake occurs, and Jake will be recording the force immediately after an earthquake occurs. Read me out the numbers and I will put them in the computer. All right. So 1120 grams, 1200, 1150, 1050, and 900. So those are the before, the stresses just before the earthquake. Okay. Now I'm going to read you the stresses just after the earthquake. 620 grams, 560, 620, 380, 400. Now here comes the cumulative times. Okay. 2.84 seconds, mm -hmm. 4.96 seconds, 7.14 seconds, mm -hmm. 9.21 seconds. That's it. Great. In order to ensure more accurate data, you can set up a video camera with a shot similar to this one. I've just graphed the data from this past experiment and the x-axis represents the cumulative time in seconds, and the y-axis represents the force or stress measured in grams. And I've connected the data points, and what we have is stress accumulating until it reaches a failure stress, 
and an earthquake occurs, and it drops its stress down to a minimum or background amount. But it's important to note that the stress never completely goes to zero. Another way of framing the time-predictable hypothesis is that earthquakes occur when a failure stress is reached. That's what these blue dots represent. And another way of looking at the slip-predictable hypothesis is that earthquakes drop their stress to the minimum or background amount, and that's what these red dots represent. So I've eyeballed and drawn in best fit lines for these hypotheses. And how does our data compare? As you can see, neither hypothesis perfectly matches the data, so we can't use constant minimum and constant failure stress as accurate earthquake predictors. The beauty of Quakecaster is that every time we run experiments, we see different results. Sometimes certain hypotheses match the data better than others, and that's what makes these experiments so much fun. And we hope that this model really illuminates Earth processes and encourages experimentation while making learning fun for people of all ages.